everybody. This is Melinda Emerson, the Small Biz Lady, America's number one small business expert. And welcome to another edition of the Small Biz Chat Podcast. I have an amazing show in store for you today. We're going to be talking about how to look great on video and how to develop a brand that really resonates. There's a lot of clutter and noise out here in the marketplace, so it's really important to develop compelling videos that people want to watch because it's not about them watching, it's about how many times they watch. And as well, you don't want to be just another brand out here that sells the same crap everybody else is selling. One of my experts has a brand new book out, and he's going to talk about how we can build a brand that is memorable and actually actually helpful to people. Now, here on the Small Biz Chat Podcast, our mission is to end small business failure. We are a peer-to-peer mentoring show. And the point of that is that I bring in experts to give you advice that otherwise you would have to pay for. And my guests all come from different walks of life and give you different perspectives, all with the goal of helping you take your business to the next level. And today's show is sponsored by Small Biz Lady Academy, my new membership site for women entrepreneurs who are looking to start or grow, but more importantly, have a confidential community of women cheering them on in their business. Now it's time for me to introduce my guest for today. My first guest is creative strategist and video producer, Leticia Crippen. I also have the author of the brand new book, Appreciated Branding, and his name is Reed Holmes. So I'm very excited to learn from both of them. So let's get started. Now it's time for me to introduce my guest, Letitia Crippen. She's an award-winning creative strategist and video producer. As CEO of Touch Management, LLC, she has more than 20 years of experience producing and directing programming for television, streaming platforms, and corporate conferences. Letitia also works with business owners to craft relevant content creation strategies for sales and marketing efforts. She's committed to developing the next generation of storytellers and media leaders. She leads a digital ministry volunteers. She also teaches at Community Access Media, and she is a mentor to marketing and film students. For more information, you can go to touchmgmt.com. All right. Leticia, welcome to the Small Biz Chat Podcast. Thank you so much for having me, Melinda. It's a pleasure to be here. All right. So give me your backstory. How did you get on this journey to becoming an amazing producer and director? Well, I always say it started when I was in kindergarten, when I was doing the morning announcements. I've always had a passion for communications, media, all throughout my education and really found my passion when I joined my local community access channel, shout out to Philly Cam here in Philadelphia. And creating content for small businesses really allowed me to pour my gifts into other people and essentially have that sense of um, accomplishment and being able to help people grow their business. All right, so let's get into it. What makes a great video? So a great video has multiple components, but the first and foremost thing that every small business owner needs to understand and focus on is to make sure that they are generating a specific emotion or response from their viewer. That response is going to, that emotion that you're going to create from the viewer triggers them to take an action, whether it be buying your products, your services, or just continue to like your videos. So a lot of those things are lighting, making sure that we can see what you're doing, making sure that you're engaging, clear and concise, and that your message is on point and resonates with what your viewers want to hear. So high quality, sound, timing, they're all really crucial, but you have to make sure you look good as well. A lot of times we are in this season of scammers. They're all over the place. And so making sure that you are looking credible and that your videos are well produced allows me, your consumer, to feel comfortable with making that purchase 
of your goods or services. So great videos really require a lot of different elements, but making sure that you're giving the people what they want, you're talking to them, they hear you, and that you look good while you're doing it, those are the key components. All right, so there's all these people out here that are terrified of video, right? So how do you get started with producing videos when you have like little to no experience? If you have little to no experience, I always say is to start by watching other people who are in a similar industry as you. If it's not broke, don't fix it. There's formulas to a lot of these things. And so mimicking what other people are doing is a great way to start. So if you have a business where you're selling hair care products, look and see what the rest of the market is doing as it relates to how they're selling and marketing their hair care products online. But then I always say, it's okay to hire a director or producer. Sometimes these social media gurus just try to make it seem a little too cookie cutter and say, oh, you're just going to throw your camera up and you're going to sell the product and people are going to, you're going to go viral. And it doesn't necessarily work that way. I always say, try to bring on someone like myself, a producer, a director who is there with you, who can coach you through the process tell you, hey, this sounds great. Rephrase what you're saying. Let's fix your positioning and making sure that that video hits every single time. So bring someone on to coach you. But then if you can't do that, watch what other people are doing and just get started. The only way to know how to do it the right way is to just do it. All right. So I want to clarify something. So are you saying... Do not record videos with your phone. Is that what you're saying? So you can record your videos with your phone, okay? But there's a certain way to do it. For example, you want to make sure you're using your back camera. When you're using your phone, the back of your camera, that, that lens, it's far more high, it's better quality that way than your front camera. You can use your everyday simple things that are around your house, a lamp, a light, but you have to use those things. Don't sit in a dark corner and think that it's going to look good. Use the simple everyday things around your home to really bring forth some great quality. But yes, you can use your cell phone. It's okay. All right. Well, I'm glad you clarified that because you made me feel like I needed a whole crew up in here. All right. Now, talk to me about... Does every video need a plan or or should you just I mean, because I see all these people, they're sitting in their car and their computer, their phone is on their dashboard and they're talking. Right. Or do you need to like have a mini script and kind of think about it and have your bullets like like what is the best way to do you need a plan for a video project or should these spur of the moment top of the dome videos be what you're putting out here? So the easiest way to answer that is it depends. Every company has a different audience and a different brand standard that they're upholding. And so even when you see people in their car and it looks like they just threw their phone up on a dash and they're filming, that video was perfectly planned. They planned where they were going to sit their car. They planned out which bullet points that they were going to cover in that video um, they, and then they edit it right at the end of the day. So every good video must be well thought out and planned. And depending on what your audience needs to see determines your level of execution or planning. So I always say the first thing you want to figure out is what am I, what do I want the people to do? Is it that I want them after this video to feel compelled to buy something right away because they're going fast? Is it that I want them to share this video with someone else because this story really resonated with them? We have to first figure out what the intent of the video is to determine what the plan is going to be. Once we know what we want the end user to do with this video, once they finish watching, it might be just to watch another video. That's fine. We're going to plan out telling them what to do after they watch the video. And we're certainly going to plan out everything that we're going to say, because in this day and age, you only have a few seconds to get your message across. 
Some people go longer than others, but the sooner you can get your message across, the better. So let's talk about style and tone. How do you figure out um, the style and tone you should have for your videos? And should that be consistent in all of your videos? Yeah, so your style and tone doesn't have to be the same in every video. But overall, when we talk about branding, your brand has its own vibe, as we like to say, at the end of the day. And so whatever you do needs to fit within that vibe. So there are some brands that are more corporate, right? They're business to business selling. And so dressing a certain way, speaking a certain way, your audience may or may not resonate if you look like you just came from the nightclub, right? So you might want to have a nice blazer on, some clean glasses, have a clean backdrop because that is your target audience. And your tone may be calm and cool and collected if you're a therapist versus if you're someone who's trying to get people excited about you know, trying out scuba diving for the first time because you're a scuba instructor, then your tone is going to be different. So it really depends on your audience and the type of business that you're in. And again, I can't say it enough. What type of emotion do you want to help generate in that end user so that they can really understand what it is that you're trying to sell? All right, so talk to me about how can you make your videos stand out in a saturated market? Because nowadays, everybody's shooting videos. Everybody's putting podcasts and, and stuff out here. So what? What? how do you make your video stand out from the noise? So the first thing that you want to do is stick to the market. If you are, for example, there are people out here that are seamstress, right? And they're making clothes with African print. OK, so if you're in that market, you don't want to make videos for everyone that's a seamstress. There's a specific group of people who like that type of clothing and you want to make things for them. So it's very, very important that your tone, your style all resonates with that particular group. And if you fit into your niche, I, I heard a great business person once say, you want to take 100% of 1%. Don't try to cater to everyone. Focus on that very small niche group and then you can count out all the noise. And it's not a saturated market anymore, right? It's smaller. It's more focused and concerted and be engaged in that market. A lot of business owners, they want to make videos for this particular group to buy their products and services, but they are then the business owner themselves aren't immersed in those groups. So join those different communities, join those different Facebook groups, get into the conversation in the comments because the more that you're a part of that community the more they are going to engage with your brand as well online i love it i love it all right and can you share the software like the tools that you use to do video because people need lights people need mics people might even need a digital camera so what are your favorite brands of these things um, for people to use. People might need a teleprompter too. So we can talk about that too. Absolutely. You can get really in the weeds with video production, but for small business owners that are really just trying to get their feet wet, maybe don't have a large team. I always say you can use your cell phone. If you don't feel comfortable using your cell phone and you want to use a camera, Canon is a fantastic brand that is really what we call prosumer, where you can really pick it up, plug and go, and it has some great settings that's going to make you look good right away. When it comes to editing, this is the piece that people get really afraid about. It's editing this video. How do I edit this video? I love CapCut. CapCut is great because it's one thing to make a video, but in today's day and age, People are consuming media in quiet spaces. And so if you don't have captions, closed captions on the screen where people can read what you're saying, it's almost a miss with your video. So CapCut 
has a fantastic AI tool that is extremely smart, makes very good captivating captions on the screen. And that is like my favorite tool. It is very close to some professional video editing tools that I use, like Final Cut Pro, After Effects. So CapCut, I say every small business owner should have a professional CapCut account putting captions on their videos at the very least. All right. What what about the mics you and use? Mics, Rode, R-O-D-E, is what I like to use. Very crisp, professional sounds. And for some of my clients, like as you mentioned with teleprompter, some people can't just go on the fly and talk. You have to read a script, perhaps. There are so many free teleprompter apps that you can download from the App Store for Apple products and just get a simple iPad up and read your teleprompter that way. There are so many free tools out here that you can use. I really encourage people to take advantage of them. A simple ring light can do the trick as well. Again, you don't wanna overcomplicate things, but those those tools are my tried and true. Road, CapCut, Canon camera, you can't lose, can't lose. I love it. And when we come right back, we're going to talk more about how to look great on video. You're watching the Small Biz Chat podcast, and we will be right back. Hi, I'm Melinda Emerson, the Small Biz Lady, and I want to welcome you to smallbizladyacademy.com, your go-to resource for women entrepreneurs. Whether you're just starting out or ready to grow, we've got everything you need to succeed. From expert interviews to live coaching sessions, our platform offers practical tools and strategies to help you build a profitable small business. Join our vibrant community of like-minded entrepreneurs today and take your business to new heights. Visit smallbizladyacademy.com and start your journey. Welcome back to the Small Biz Chat Podcast. I'm Melinda Emerson, your host, and I'm here with Letitia Crippen from Touch Management, and we're talking about how to look great on video. All right, Letitia, everybody's using Chat GPT for some of everything. So can you use Chat GPT for your videos too? Absolutely. I love Chat GPT, but I just want anyone who's listening to this to remember Chat GPT is only as good as you make it. So when we talk about prompting your Chat GPT, it is very important that you are very clear and concise and as descriptive as possible as what as to what you want so that it can give you the proper response. So I love using Chat GPT to script out my videos or even plan out what a video edit could look like. So if you tell ChatGPT, hey, I want to do a video that is gonna make people wanna buy my um, mm-hmm. ebook on basket weaving and I want it to be exciting and engaging, then you tell it that. And then you ask, it can tell you what videos or pictures or B-roll to use. You can ask it to give you a script Tell it your tone. I want it in the tone of a Black woman's voice, right? It'll tweak it in different ways to resonate with your audience. And ChatGPT just takes out a lot of guesswork, helps you get to your end result quicker. Um, but the but its recommendations are really, really impressive. Now, I know that short form content has become the soup du jour, right? Everybody's doing these these 20, 30, 45 second top videos. But can you talk about the long form game versus the the short form game when it comes to video production? Absolutely. So short form is really your everyday consumption. It is some quick moments to just remind people that you're there. Really, that's what short form does. Long form is more for those who are looking to inform people, educate folks. So you see a lot of long form primarily on YouTube where people are using that as a form of television. They are sitting in front of the screen and they expect to be there for 10 minutes or more. Short form on YouTube is a growing industry, but they're really just trying to compete with the TikToks and of the world. And it's okay for that, but that's a lot of young users, children are really 
following YouTube shorts a lot, but long form is really when you're, if you're in the space of educating and informing people, really consider doing long form. And long form these days is from three minutes to 11 minutes is a nice sweet spot for you to both, I think are effective tools depending on the audience that you're reaching and the type of business that you have. But I encourage every business owner to leverage both of them. Love it. Love it. All right. So what role does story storytelling play in a good video, right? Because even if you're just talking for 30 minutes, people sell people things in 30 minutes all the time. So how how important is your storytelling ability when it comes to making great video? It's a great question. And people throw around the term storytelling all the time. And what I want people to realize and remember is that every great presentation starts with a good story, ends with a great story. And so storytelling, and why do we do that when we're doing, when you watch people do PowerPoint presentations or the like, it's because people need to feel connected. And so you have to use storytelling as a way to connect with your audience where they're looking or listening to you and saying, hey, that happened to me before, or I know someone that that happened to, or I feel the same way. It allows you to build a deep connection and community with your audience. And so that way it's not just transactional. Sometimes you get on these pages and they're like, hey, buy my thing, buy my thing, buy my thing. But we don't know you. We don't know what was, why did you create this product? But when you find out, oh, because this person is a single mother and I'm also a single mother or my mother was a single mother and I support single mothers, I'm going to buy your product and I might not even need the product. But it's because of who you are and the story that you share with me allowed me to create that deep connection with you. And a wise person always told me when people are making a purchase, that and, and they're giving you their hard earned cash to buy something from you. That's a personal thing. That's not a business thing. I love it. I love it. All right. And then second last question, what advice would you give someone just starting out trying to build video with, with you know, video content? What would you do? So the first thing I would say is just start. Don't overthink it. It's important to test the waters and see what your people want from you so that you can start to tweak. If you look at any successful business page and you go to the beginning of their social social media, it does not look like the content that they're making now. But what they did was learn and they were able to pivot and change and grow and essentially give the people what they want. And social media has trained changed a lot in that aesthetics was the thing, right? Pretty, everything had to be pretty. Everything had to look white and cream and all these things. But now it's all about authenticity. People want to see the real you. People want to know the real you. And the more that you are authentic to who you are and your brand, the more success you're going to have. And a lot of us as business owners, we're too busy doing the business. So if it, if you're too busy to make a video about the business, show them, show them you working in the business. That allows them to see, oh, this person's a hustler. They're dedicated to great quality, customer service. And so you don't have to overthinking it, overthink it. Just show them, you know, show them you working in the business. And a lot of times that's some of the best content. I love it. Last question. What is the best business advice you've ever received? The best business advice that I've ever received, and I, I think I've said it a couple of times on here, is just, just start. A lot of times we do not succeed in business because we're overthinking things. We're trying to perfect everything and we're not just getting it going. So whatever it is that I am thinking about doing, I start and I perfect it along the way. And that is critical to learning how to pivot your business and shift when the economy requires you to is to be able to take those risks and just jump all the way in. You'll figure it out from there. All right. Thank you so much, Letitia Crippen, CEO of Touch Management. When we come back, we're going to be talking about how to sharpen up your branding. You're watching the Small Biz Chat podcast, and we will be right back. Hi, I'm Melinda Emerson, the Small Biz Lady, and I want to welcome you to smallbizladyacademy.com, your go-to resource for women entrepreneurs. 
Whether you're just starting out or ready to grow, we've got everything you need to succeed. From expert interviews to live coaching sessions, our platform offers practical tools and strategies to help you build a profitable small business. Join our vibrant community of like-minded entrepreneurs today and take your business to new heights. Visit smallbizladyacademy.com and start your journey. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to the Small Biz Chat Podcast. I'm Melinda Emerson, your host, and hopefully you're watching us on my YouTube channel or my Small Biz Lady fan page on Facebook. As always, if you hear something great, leave us a comment, or if there's a topic you would like us to address, please be sure to put that in the comments as well. We want to make sure that we're giving you what you want. All right, now it's time for me to introduce my guest, Reed Holmes. He's a branding expert, a speaker, an author, and after 30 years at an ad agency as its chief marketing officer, Reed has had an epiphany and he's been interrupted. He said he's tired of seeing brands just interrupt people and wasting billions chasing transactions, leaving customers saturated by brand indifference and high price sensitivity. He believes that branding in the digital era is about proving you care. Whether you're a B2C or B2B marketer, everything is about B2H. And he says, we're all human and people need to talk to people that way. Reed has a plan to help you live your value so that you can attract, engage, and keep like-minded customers with what Reed calls reverse targeting. He's the author of the brand new book, Appreciated Branding. So for more information, head over to appreciatedbranding.com. Reed, welcome to the Small Biz Chat Podcast. Thanks, Melinda. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm honored to be your guest here. Thanks. So tell us, Reed, how did you get on this journey that you decided to stop working for the man and start working with the little people, right? <laughs> how did you go from all those big brands that you've worked with, what, H&R Block and on and on and on? You've worked with some of the biggest brand campaigns in the world, and you finally said enough already. So so talk to us about your journey. Yeah, that's um uh, that's a great place to start. I think um, for me, uh, I spent 30 years uh, in the boardrooms of America presenting big ideas for multi-million dollar campaigns. And um, I realized as my kids reached high school that that's a pretty ephemeral pursuit. I go in, I, I create something, it does its job, and and then it goes away. And when my kids were getting out of high school, I realized, well, what am I doing to make the world a better place? Like, is there is there something I can do with my skill set that uh, that can help with that? And I spent some time thinking about it. I looked over all the work I've done in my career, and I found a commonality that's kind of like a win win win, where it's um, it's going to help businesses do better and be more, more meaningful. Uh, as a brand, it's going to drive higher business results, particularly for performance marketing, which is not necessarily a small business uh, pursuit. Um, and I've worked with lots of small businesses too. But in the bigger, in the bigger kind of marketing world, performance marketing does much better when you have a well-defined brand. And so, and, and I would say in some cases, it's been proven to at least 4X better. And then um, I think lastly is the, the third win of this is that um, by doing this kind of thing, the world will become a better place. And that's my ultimate goal. How do I leave the world a better place? I mean, the, the old Indian uh, line was we borrow the world from our children. Yes, definitely. So your book is called Appreciated Branding. It's a term that you have coined. Why don't you explain to us what, (laughs) shameless plug, why don't you um, tell us what is appreciated branding? Yeah, I think um, to me, it's the next stage of what branding needs to become. Because we've gone from what is, um, I don't know if you guys have ever heard of Ross Reeves, but back in the 1920s, uh, he coined a thing called the unique selling proposition. And that was a very rational statement. It's a, uh, it's a, well, to use a Saturday night live reference, it's a floor polish. So it's also a dessert topping. You know, it's a very rational uh, kind of appeal or, you, you know, uh, soften your hands while you do the dishes or, you know, uh, the quicker picker upper, or the very rational 
very logical appeals. And that worked for a long time, and it still works to a certain extent. But back in, you know, in, in the interruption model, and you had men mentioned interruption, when the interruption model started back in the 50s after the war, uh, so many products were new and different, and consumerism was just getting up on its feet. And, you know, this kind of interruption model worked because it's just like, I've got a new washing machine, I need a soap to work, to run it soap operas were the perfect thing to kind of advertise that right people had the bandwidth to abide these kind of interruptions so now it's 50 60 what is it you know 60 65 years later and we are interrupted everywhere we are we are literally pinged and dinged and and texted and you know there I, I'm reminded of that old video of the the poor woman who was responding to a text walking through a mall and she fell into a into a a, a fountain you know because she was not paying attention. Um, the 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 human mind has a finite amount of of um, in uh, you know room for interruption and information processing and the the nowadays. I think it's. I think the the attention span is shorter than a goldfish. It's down to like two point seven, two point you know three seconds, and you know that which speaks to a lot of what Letitia was saying. You know, you, you've got to be providing things that are of value that that attract people. That's what appreciated branding is, and I would crystallize it as doing basically selling. You're not just showing that you care about yourself. You're you're showing that you care about the people you're trying to attract. So are you solving a problem that they don't recognize they have? That's essentially what appreciated branding is. So you mentioned um, unique value proposition, but I know in your book, you talk about unique emotional solution. So tell yeah. me what, what is that? Okay. So as a good example, I have a couple examples in my book. Uh, and that's a, a term I coined because when you look at a lot of the, what the bigger and better brands are doing these days, and I've realized that I've done some of this in my career, as I look back on some of the work I did, um, you're, you're not sell, solving a rational problem. You're solving an emotional problem. You're, you've found an emotional place to be. And I can give you two different examples of that. Number one, from let's say a small business perspective, let's say you're a, a tennis coach and you want to get more tennis lessons. And so you say, hey, I'm a tennis coach who wants tennis lessons. You know, he might get a little business here and there, but what emotional problem is he solving? It's a very rational promise. Oh, tennis lessons. Do I want tennis lessons? No, okay. But if you say something like, who has kids that are bouncing off the walls and need to be busy to give you a moment's rest? People are going to go, oh, that's me. I get that. That that is me. I would actually, you know, I would love to give my kids tennis lessons because I would have a, some time to myself. I would get uh, they would get exposed to a, a good activity that will help that hopefully they'll have for life. And um, you know, I, I feel like emotionally, I'm doing a good thing for both me and my kids. So th you can kind of see the difference there. So on a bigger scale, and I do this, uh, I have this example in my book. And I wish I had done this campaign. I didn't, but I found it and I'm so glad I did. And it's such a wonderful example. But so in India, there are basically, uh, my understanding is there's two basically laundry detergents that are fighting, constantly fighting for share. And they're both trying to be louder than they were last time to get a little more far right of the decimal point share next time. And this is basically uh, you know you're, you're you're relegating yourself to a price decision because the laundry business back in the 50s was three or four different brands and now go into walmart and look at the laundry aisle it's 30 feet long and eight feet high with brands all solving the same problem and that's something that Letitia was saying earlier is just like, are you doing anything unique? What What is it that is different about you or how you want to be or solve your problem? So what they did in India is they launched a campaign for this brand called Ariel, where it wasn't, hey, we get white or whites or we do more bright colors. They realized uh, from a data point, and most of these ideas come from a data point that's a real truth about human existence and human life. And that's why I say B to H. 
And in this case, they found this this data point that 95% of the people in India still thought laundry was a woman's job. And so Ariel came out and said, is that right? I mean, we're just throwing it out there. And they had a, a hashtag they called share the load. Share the load took off. I mean, they, they had commercials that showed, you know, a woman coming home from work, her husband's reading the paper on the couch, she's picking up toys, she's trying to get dinner on the table, she's on the phone with her last minute thing from work, she's texting and emailing, and her son shouts from upstairs, is my green shirt clean, I need it tonight. And it, a, a, a line just comes up and says, why is laundry still just a woman's job? And they, it killed, it killed. Sales went up 76%. 76%. You don't get that from promotional marketing. Right. And the reason that happened is because the because women who buy laundry detergent said, thank you. Thank you for giving me some air cover here because I've been swimming in, in laundry for 30 years, you know? So that's what I'm talking about. That is appreciated branding, an act of good was done. And, and I want to make a sure there's a, I want to make a point here. There's a very difference between a very big difference between purpose-based uh, advertising and purpose-based marketing, because that's really, I think a lot of people see that as this grand altruism. It's like we're replanting trees in the, in the rainforest, but it would be much more meaningful to me and much more helpful to me in my daily life. If you replanted trees in the neighborhood where I live, now I'm like, oh, thank you. Thanks for doing that. This is something I see every day and I can truly appreciate. So that hopefully that helps you kind of understand the difference um, of between where I think branding needs to go to break through because we're all getting 10,000 messages a day. I don't know what to care about. I don't even have time to pay attention to stuff. If you're talking to me on a values channel that I already care about, you're going to get my attention and you're going to be much more meaningful to me as I go forward. I love that. Talking to people on a values channel. I love that. I'm going to use that. I'm going I'm to give you credit, Reed, the first time I use it, but know that I'm going to use that. But let's talk about, are there key components to an appreciated branding strategy? Is it is it you got to dig into the data? You got to find the data point? Well, I think some of the key components are generally, you have to, first thing you have to do is ask a question. Are, are you rationally unique? in the world is what you sell or the service or product you sell. Is it unique enough that it, on its own merits is like a thank you. So when Uber came out, for example, completely unique, completely changed the category and it needed explanation because it was a rational promise. Um, now they're more competitive and they they have to appeal to things and find different ways to appeal based on more of an emotional unique emotional solution right so th they're they're starting to do more of that because now they the category is getting although that's that's not a great example of a of a much more crowded category because there's it's still pretty open but if you think about you know candy bars is another example i have in the book um finally snickers realized that Packed with uh, peanuts, Snickers really satisfied. Satisfies is kind of an indulgence message, a rational message about the rational benefits of that product that isn't necessarily very, uh, you know, persuasive because you're selling the category. You're basically selling indulgence. Snickers finally figured out. Well, what is it that what's a unique emotional solution that we can solve here? Oh, I've got it. Here's an insight. And this is another one of the things that that these things have in common. It's an it comes out of an insight that hasn't been recognized and nobody owns yet. And their insight was, you know, when you're hungry, you're just not performing your best. Snickers can be that solution, that unique emotional solution. So now Snickers is, um, you know, you're not yourself when you're hungry. Grab a Snickers. And then you got Betty White on the Super Bowl, you know, playing a, you know, playing a uh, uh, a guy, you know, who's bonking. He he doesn't have the energy, and you know, it's it, it was it was a global campaign, and it killed, and it did great. Uh, but that's that's the shift. You have to shift from okay, I'm either I'm either com uh, contributing to a ton of noise, and therefore, if I'm getting through, people are going to go, okay, I'll consider you, but it's really about price, or you're doing something where you go, oh, they get me. They care about me. They're doing something to help me recognize a problem I didn't realize I had. And 
that's really cool. And I, I want to give them my attention and my business. Well, what are some of the challenges with this though, right? Because every brand doesn't fit into this we care about you box, right? Sometimes your toilet tissue is just toilet tissue, right? You know what I mean? Like, how do you, are there challenges around using this philosophy with just any product or service? It takes, it's, it's, it takes work, but you need to find ideas that are, I mean, if you think about a Venn diagram, what is it you do? What is it, you know, what are the values of the business or the company, you know, and you have to make sure that you're true to that. Now there may be values to to um I'm trying to think if there was another example. Um oh uh another example in the book, for example, is um is for a, an alcoholic beverage. Okay. So what what there's a, a brand called Rua Vieja. It's a Spanish brand of liqueur. It's kind of like a um um you know uh, what is that um urban cognac. Yeah, but it's a, uh, it's like a, the stuff you drink around the holidays. Um, it's God, I can't think of it. It's a, it's a chocolatey kind of a, anyway. Oh, I know. Oh, Kahlua. Is it like Kahlua? Yeah, that kind of thing. Right. So it's a, it's a liqueur. So they're, they're competing and you might think, well, how could a, how could a liqueur be an appreciated brand? I mean, how do you create appreciation for, for a brand like that? Well, what they did is they started looking around and they're like, well, what are the moments that this brand is used for? Well, people use it or this product even, you know, that, that no one else has capitalized on. So they realized that people drink liqueur and liquor and these types of things when they're sitting with their friends, when they're having a, you know, having a, after work or, or doing something together. So what they did is they realized and and they they found a tool that happened to exist in Spain and I I need to dig out I'd love to learn more about this but but as an example it's it really pertinent here. Um, there's a tool that existed where you could go. Actually, I think they created it as a, oh, they created it as an online tool and that's another thing that I should mention is one of the commonalities of an appreciated branding approach is that it always has a hub, share the load hashtag. Um, in this case. Their, their idea was we need to spend more time together. And the motivator behind that was you could go to this website and you could put in a friend, how old they are, and or a relative or whatever. And it would literally kind of go through a lot, some machinations and some, some kind of uh, algorithm. And it would say, you have four hours left in your life with this person. And they would basically go because people are going to, people work, things get canceled, people um, have trips. You know, people's and they really go, you might think you you're 50 now and you've got 30 years left. But in reality, when life comes and all the things you have to do come along, you really only have 10 to 12 hours left that you're going to spend time with this person. So spend it wisely and enjoy that time. And that's where this idea of you have we have to spend more time together came. And in that case, uh, sales went up 46 percent. Because it had that unique emotional solution. You're not just selling me liqueur and you're not selling it to me on the rational benefits of taste or variety or whatever. You're saying you didn't real you might not realize this, but the amount of time you have left to spend with your loved ones isn't as much as you thought. Take some time and and do that. Thank you. Thank you for telling me that. Thank you for figuring that out for me. I really appreciate that because I do love these people and I do want to spend more time with them. They did an online video, um, almost a documentary about this, and they had people, people were crying. They didn't realize they just didn't have that much time. And so that's where this really starts to take root is you, you've got the opportunity in whatever your business is, whatever your product is, whatever your service is, look at the usage uh, um, times that you that it, it gets used. Look at what surrounds it. Look at cultural cues. Look how the world has changed. You know, in the, in the laundry example, and I'm, I feel like I'm going off here like – so I'll shut up in a second, but the laundry example, it's the same. It's always the same question, but the answer is different. So in the fifties, the question was, how do we help women do laundry? And the answer back then was one cap full does a whole load or whatever, you know, a very rational promise. The answer to that question, how do we help women get their laundry done is they need some help. Let's, let's get them some help. Because <laughs> this is crazy that they're still doing all of everybody's laundry. So 
that that's another commonality is it's usually the same question. It's just like, what has changed in society or culture or, or that kind of thing that, that you can provide a different perspective on or a different answer that people go, Oh my God, thank you for, I'd never even thought of that. That's really helpful. I love it. I love it. All right. Reed, what is the best business advice you've ever been given? You know, it actually comes from a book and it's uh, a book called Think and Grow Rich. And it's and, and it, it sounds like it's about, you know, how to get rich, but it really is about a rich life. And it's about um, deciding what you want and letting the universe help you get there. And that's that's more of the journey I'm on. right. I know it sounds kind of very fairy, but that's the journey I'm on right now. And I have to say the universe is coming back. And th- me being here is a perfect example of that. You know, a week ago, Belinda, you and I were talking on a on a different uh, platform and you invited me here and I'm so grateful. And I, I would a, a week ago, I never would have said I'd be on this podcast, which, which has all these viewers and so many great, smart people that now I'm a part of that group. And I'm the, gratitude is the biggest thing, I think it's and it's at the heart of this book that I've written. But I think it opens up doors and it and it and that kind of positive uh look at the world helps you receive things in a more positive way as opposed to just complaining that things aren't going well or whatever. There's always things going well. Celebrate those things. Think about those things. Well, my my father used to have a saying. He used to say that you're supposed to um, thank God for the bad days too, right? So that you wouldn't know what good days were if you didn't have bad days, right? So it's like you have to be grateful for the journey, I think. Yeah. Is- Yep. really um, what I think you're saying, but I think that's so beautiful and poignant read. And I'm so grateful that we met. I'm excited about your book, appreciated branding. Um, and uh, when we come right back, we're going to talk about our favorite topic on this show, our hit it or quit it panel. So stay with us. We'll be right back. Hi, I'm Melinda Emerson, the small biz lady, and I want to welcome you to smallbizladyacademy.com your go-to resource for women entrepreneurs. Whether you're just starting out or ready to grow, we've got everything you need to succeed. From expert interviews to live coaching sessions, our platform offers practical tools and strategies to help you build a profitable small business. Join our vibrant community of like-minded entrepreneurs today and take your business to new heights. Visit smallbizladyacademy.com and start your journey. Welcome back to the Small Biz Chat Podcast. I'm Melinda Emerson, your host, America's number one small business expert. And it's time for our favorite segment on the Small Biz Chat Podcast. We call it the Hit It or Quit It panel. Now, here's how it works. Each and every guest is asked the exact same question. You only have 30 seconds to answer. And if you do not answer in 30 seconds, you get the cowbell. I don't want to give you that. So what I want you to do is do not repeat somebody else's answer. So if somebody takes your answer, you got to go back to the drawing board, okay, and come up with something else. So I'm going to invite my guests back, Letitia Crippen and Reed Holmes. And I'm going to participate today, too, to make it fun. And so we are going to talk about... um, uh, we're going to talk about hit it or quit it. So our first question for the day, and I'm going to come to you, Letitia, first, because you've been on ice the longest. So what is your favorite podcast? Favorite podcast? What do you got? Well, I have to be honest, Melinda. It's the Small Biz Chat podcast. <laughs> um, the amount of knowledge that I get from this podcast is just phenomenal. And I love sharing with other people what I've learned. So I'm going to say Small Biz Chat Podcast. Well, gold star for you for kissing up to me. I appreciate it. <laughs> it's the no, truth. It's the truth. We've been doing it a long time. We have almost yeah. 300 episodes. So I really do appreciate that. We have thousands and thousands of fans. So I'm I'm grateful to hear you say that. All right, Reed, what is your favorite podcast? Uh, it's called How I Built This. And it's uh, it's a podcast from um, I can't remember can't remember where it's from, but it's it's basically interviews with people who started businesses and um, you know have and are probably pretty well known now and are are reasonably successful. And this is everything from 
uh, you know, that he interviewed a woman who um, was lived in Texas and started making muffins and built a million dollar business making muffins. And, and, uh, and then, and then you got the big ones like um, I'm going to run out of time, but there are other big ones. It's really cool. It's a great podcast. Are you talking about the podcast with Guy Raz? Yes, that's it. Yeah. So you just took mine, but Oh shoot. Okay. <laughs> So <laughs> this is really funny. So another podcast that I really like is Hidden Brain from NPR. I oh, like that's a good one. A little bit of a, a data nerd, so I actually like Hidden Brain. Um, but I was gonna say um, how I made this by Guy Raz. That's really funny that you took mine. I have to give myself the cowbell. Anyway, all right. Next question, <laughs> Reed. I'm gonna come to you first this time, and then you, Letitia. What is your favorite business app? Favorite business app. You know, um, as we talked about, I've left the corporate world and I'm out on my own now. And so I have to say I've been uh, very, very happy with the Intuit um, app for, you know, managing business finances and things like that. Okay. So, so QuickBooks, is that what you're talking about? Yeah, that's it. QuickBooks. <laughs> I uh, <laughs> I know it is Intuit. I, I don't know why that's the only name I remember, but yeah, QuickBooks. Well, Intuit bought it. So yeah, I mean, yeah. It, it, yeah. Um, but yeah, QuickBooks, I guess that's as good as any. <laughs> no, I mean, it allows you to go, you know, use your phone, you, you know, it's, it's all in a cloud. So it's, 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 um, it's a really easy way to kind of manage taxes, manage accounts, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, Letitia, what's your favorite app? So I love Asana. Um, it really allows me to just manage my projects with my team and cross collaborate on things. It the it's very user friendly. I love the user experience. It's I just love using it as a project management collaboration tool for creatives at the very least. Great, great, it's good. Project management tools are always great. My favorite app is actually a scheduling app that I use is called Mixmax. And I love it because I have Calendly too, but I actually use Mixmax a lot more because if I want to give somebody options for three different dates on my calendar, I can shoot them to them in an email and the, whichever one they click on goes on their calendar and on mine. And I love this app. There's a lot more um, marketing automation functionality to it, but the main function that I use it for is actually scheduling. And I love it. Um, all right. Next question. Reed, I'm coming to you first for this one. What is your favorite old school marketing tip? Um, what is my favorite old school marketing tip? Uh, I think it's uh, don't tell people how good you are. Tell people how good you can make them. Mm. I like that. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Letitia, what do you got? So I, I love word of mouth is like just my golden rule for getting information out there, getting your business out there. So I always say, tell anyone who would listen about your business. I made so many connections by just sharing with people what I do. And then they, you know, lo and behold, need services or they know someone else that needs services. And I'm just that word of mouth and connection has just always really helped bring in general um, business for me. So I just think it still works like a gym. Well, I would say my favorite old school marketing tip is pick up the phone and call somebody. It's amazing. We all want to hide behind all this technology and 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 I love LinkedIn, right? You know, but I feel like the whole goal of social media has got to be to book a call. Like book a call. That like the magic happens over the phone. And so I'm a big fan of of phone calls. All right. Last question. Um Letitia, I'm coming to you first this time. What is your best business book you've ever read? Um, so The Year of Yes by Shonda Rhimes. Um, she is my fairy godmother in my mind, um, renowned producer and executive. And it, it's about women in business in a way and just how she lives in her truth and talks about how she grew and um, from writing to being an executive producer has really guided me in my director and producer journey. Love it. All right, Reed, what do you got? What's your favorite, best business book you ever read? 
Um, that's a really good question. I'm scrolling through my, <laughs> uh, I'm scrolling through my audiobooks on, um, audible, but, um, gosh, there's a lot of them. I, you know, you, you made me think, uh, Leticia of a book by, uh, Tina Fey called bossy pants and it's not necessarily a business book, but what it taught me is the beauty of, uh, improv and how improv is a great way to kind of work with you know, have the, the power of possible the power of of um of um yes uh yes and i mean that's kind of the secret to improv uh so i've i've kind of really internalized that and um i also recently read a book about richard branson called the virgin way and uh, you know i a big, I love these kinds of books that, that, that I mean, it's kind of a, a, a 300 page version of how I built this. Right. So, uh, so I love those books because you find little things that you can, you can do and learn from those things. So from those books. And my favorite book is 10 X is easier than two X by Dan Sullivan. Um, I am a bibliophile. I love books. I have books all around me. Um, audible everywhere. Um, but that book has been the most impactful for me in the past year. And I changed my favorite book like every six months, but I've been holding on to Dan's book for a while. So I love the book. I've listened to it two or three times and I've read it. It's awesome. It'll change your business perspective and, and, and it'll change your life too. And it's just a great read. Um, so I thank you both so much for being on this edition of the Small Biz Chat podcast. I thank you. If you all are interested in getting help with your videos, you want to talk to Miss Creative Strategist herself, Letitia Crippen. You can reach her at touchmgmt.com. You can also, if you are interested in getting a brand consultant to work with you, Reed Holmes has a brand new book out called Appreciated Branding. Be sure to grab a copy of his book on Amazon. It is a great book. I've read the first few chapters and it is amazing. So go and grab this book. And thank you all for joining me for another episode of the Small Biz Chat Podcast. If you're thinking about taking your business to the next level and you're a woman entrepreneur, I have the thing for you. You need to go and check out Small Biz Lady Academy. It's our monthly membership site for women entrepreneurs. If you're just starting or if you're ready to grow, we have an amazing platform we put together of 16 years of my best content. And guess what? All of our content is available in English and Spanish. So to my Latino sisters out here, I got you too. So head over and check out smallbizladyacademy.com. And with that, I will leave you with this. When it comes to business and life, you never lose. You either win or you learn. God bless everybody. See you next time.